Matthew chapter 5, verse 31 through 32, we have been dealing with the topic of defending marriage in light of what took place. And I really believe that God has ordained this message today, just as he did last week and what he'll do next week when we, we not only look at uh, oaths, but retaliation and then love by the end of the chapter. Uh, in light of what has happened in our country concerning marriage, and the attack against marriage, and not just on the front of homosexuality, same-sex marriage. That's just one issue. Uh, on the front of marriage itself, that, that there's really no need for marriage. It seems like that whole thing is being attacked as far as not seeing a need for marriage. Why, why do we need to have someone tell us that we're committed to one another, that we're in love with one another, and, and tell us that we need to go through some ceremony? Why can't we just love one another and live together? as though we're married. Now that's an attack on the institute of marriage itself. And then divorce, another attack. How quickly and easy it is for someone to get divorced today because of whatever the situation may be. Sometimes it can be as as little as something dumb or as big as, you know, adultery in itself that Jesus will deal with this morning. So I think that it's a message that is, is timely for the day and age that we're living in. I was at the pastor's conference uh, this last week, and I appreciate all the prayers. Uh, I I started the week kind of bummed because the enemy attacked. And and whenever God has a work, the enemy will always be there to attack you. That Monday morning, I probably had five different things happen that was trying to keep me from going. From the toilet overflowing to the septic tank getting plugged up again to sprinklers breaking, you know, and just all kinds of stuff. And I was really depressed when I went there. I'm like, what am I doing here? I ought to be home in my bed crying. (laughs) But I went, and it was pretty neat because the Lord was really ministering to me personally. It was a time for me and Him, a one-on-one, just uh, mano-a-mano, you know, just me and him working through these things. And it was as though I was the only person there and the Lord ministering to me. And boy, did he, did he speak to me deeply. And so um, I was really blessed this, this week. Um, one thing that I learned that really fits in today's message is one pastor was talking about marriage. That wasn't his theme, but he he squeezed this in there along with the relationships. And he was talking about the pastor's wives conference that took place last year. And at the pastor's wives conference, there was the word of the Lord to all the ladies. And the word was basically someone here is dealing with their relationship to their husband and is contemplating divorce. And the Lord was trying to encourage them not to get divorced. And so it was a specific prophecy towards a specific person. And so they decided they were going to ask that person to stand up and come forward to get prayed for. I can imagine being that person, right? Like, you're going to ask me to get up front and all in front of these ladies because the Lord's speaking to me. I'm like, I don't know. So they asked. 50% of the pastor's wife stood up and went forward. 50%. I was like, wow, wow. These are pastors that stand behind the pulpits. And their wives, and I'm sure the men too, are at least thinking about divorce or leaving their spouse. Whether it's the ministry or or whatever situation it is, the fact that they are thinking about leaving. And if these are our leadership, if these are the pastors in churches, how much more the body of Christ? How much more the body of Christ? How many times have you thought about leaving your spouse? So it is an issue that we need to deal with, that we need to battle. We're in a war, and we're in a fight against the enemy, against our flesh, and it's going to be tough. It's going to be hard, but we have to resist. We have to get forces, and that could be one another, getting involved, getting committed into men's ministries, women's ministries, and connected into church, being accountable, understanding that we're like-minded people, we go through things, and we can get through this stuff together if we bind together and stick together and work together to battle these issues. But 50%, that shouldn't be the case. shouldn't be the case. I can honestly say that there was a time where I thought about divorce, seeing my wife, and she's probably thought about divorcing me. In fact, she did because she told me she would. But thank God that we didn't go that route. But we do have children that have gone that route, and we know the the devastating factor there of what it can do to a family. And so this morning we're going to talk about marriage 
and divorce and what it means because we need to battle against these issues. Now, as we go through these two verses here, we need to understand something about divorce in the scriptures itself. Divorce is not a commandment. It is not a commandment. It's not a part of the Ten Commandments. It's not a part of any commandment that God has. It was something that was done because of the hardness of the hearts of the people. And so God allowed it to take place. And he set up a system and how to handle divorce. When you look at the Pentateuch in the Old Testament, which is the first five books of the Bible, it gives us uh, the information that we need to interpret the, the legal code of what divorce means, what uncleanliness means because their definitions are important just kind of like our, our legal codes you know uh we've got a 521 what does that mean you know let, let's interpret what a 521 is and and when is it and how is it and why is it and so forth and so when we seek to get divorced in the old testament uh, there was a code and there was an interpretation of that code and you had to go and get the interpretation from those in leadership and so that would have probably been moses and the elders at that time or the levitical priests later on as far as levitical priests because they do deal with divorce as i, I mentioned earlier 50 percent and yet uh, the bible in the old testament said that if you were a levitical priest you were restricted uh, you were not to marry somebody that was divorced. You were supposed to look for someone that was a virgin. And, and, and everything that we're going to talk about is, is from the perspective of a man towards a woman, but that has nothing to do with equality, so don't misunderstand that. That's just the perspective that, that the Bible is coming from. It holds true for the other side. But back then, the Levitical priests were restricted from marrying anyone that was divorced. He wanted to keep, uh, <clears throat> keep that man that institute pure and holy from divorce, from being defiled. And so he wanted to make sure that when you married, you married somebody that was a virgin and you were committed to one another because you're serving before the Lord. You're representing the Lord. And when you see God and how God functions as a trinity, you have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they're in perfect unity. The Bible says that they're one, right? We believe in the trinity. That there is one God. There aren't three gods. One God, but three persons. And each person has a role to play, just like in marriage. There is one marriage institute, there is one God. But there are different persons, and these persons play different roles. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father is the head. He is the head. And then you have the Son who obeys the Father or is submitted to the Father. Remember, Jesus many times said, I do everything that the Father asked me to do. He was submitted to the Father. It pleased him. In fact, he said, I have food, and the food is to do the will of the Father, to fulfill that will. And then you have the Holy Spirit that what? He brings light to the Son. He doesn't draw attention to himself. He just illuminates the relationship of the Father and the Son. That's the job or the role of the Holy Spirit. Same as the family. You have the husband who is the head, the leader, who is leading that family spiritually. And then you have the wife who comes alongside and, and she helps. Actually, she's the force behind the moving of that man. And then you have the children. They're not to draw attention to themselves. Uh, they're not to be the focus point. They're the children. They're to reflect the parents. And they're to honor the parents and so forth so just like the trinity so it's true within a family and so you have to keep that levitical priest um, career intact and not marry a divorced woman now if you have a daughter as a priest and she is divorced uh, you are not to you know in a sense uh, excommunicate her you would actually bring her back into your family and take care of her and so there's grace along with divorce, because in divorce, sometimes uh, we have a tendency of, of choosing sides, right? And we choose sides, and when we choose sides, it ends up uh, causing problems. Instead of allowing God to work through the situations, uh, we choose the sides, and it just destroys uh, relationships, not just between the couple, but also with the family itself, and parents, and then you have children also. And so it's important that we understand there's forgiveness. There's forgiveness in divorce, too. If you have been divorced there should be forgiveness by the other party and also by your family uh, you should be seeking out that forgiveness too especially if you have uh, sought out the divorce for wrong reasons 
I had to say that because there can be some guilt that is lingering there in people's lives because of divorce. But God is clear that there's always forgiveness. Remember the prodigal son? You know, he went away. The father didn't go seeking him out, but he let him go. And, and, and when he realized that it's a little harder out there in the world than with the father, and he came back, and the father, what, opened up his arms and threw a party that he's back. And we should always be looking to do that. The first commandment is to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second commandment is to love our neighbor as ourselves and so we should desire to do those things so so we have the Pentateuch um, the the um, first five books of the Bible and the certificate of divorce that we'll talk about in a second here but I wanted to touch on one more thing before we move on uh, to to the next and that is that in our relationships and I just want to talk about this up front we all have idols at one time or another, we can create idols <clears throat> at the pastor's conference. Again, as someone else uh, shared this, and I thought it was pretty profound. And in fact, I'm going to implement it in my counseling, biblical counseling, when I counsel others, is that we all have idols, and we create idols in our relationships. Uh, he said that when we counsel, the first thing we should ask is, what is your idol? What is your idol? Well, what's an idol? Well, it's not a statue that you pray to and get on your knees. Idol is more than that. It's anything that gets in the way of your relationship with, with God. You, you have this relationship with God that is open, that is pure, that is honest. And things can get in the way of that. We can disguise them into anything. It could be a house. It could be a wife. It could be a child. Uh, you can make a child an idol. He could be the focus of your whole life that you forget God. Uh, you forget other children even. I, I know parents who have lost a child and they're at the cemetery every weekend, every weekend, crying and crying and crying when they have other kids that they need to take care of. That child has become an idol. So we can create these idols in our relationships. And oftentimes in marriage, this is what happens. We go into marriage with an idol. We have a certain perspective on what we're marrying and who we're marrying. And this is how they should be. Uh, he should be like this that's that's my perfect man she should be like this that's my perfect woman and when they're not that's when we run into problems because we realize wait a minute they're not what i thought and they're not changing to the person i thought instead of accepting them for just the way they are see we're all sinners the bible's clear we all fall short of the glory of god uh, we're wretched in our hearts. And so you're just as wretched as your wife or your husband is wretched. And so accept them as they are and know that God is working in them and through them and he's going to work out his plan and their character in time. And it may take time. When Virginia and I first got married, we were 18 years old. We had met at the age of 14, actually 13. Uh, ended up dating at the age of 14, 15. And then we had a child at, at the age of 16. Now, totally, it was totally flesh. It had nothing to do with maturity, had nothing to do with um, it's time for us to get married. You know, I'm looking for someone to live the rest of my life with. It was totally flesh. Uh, teenagers, that's all it is. It's just flesh and feelings and emotions. But I was committed to her. We were, in a sense, committed to one another. But it was totally flesh. And when I accepted the Lord at the age of 24, 25, then I realized what it was supposed to be. See, I had molded her and shaped her into the image that I wanted her to be. And it wasn't the image that God had made her to be. And so when I accepted the Lord, I had to allow the Lord to work in her to make her into the person that he wanted her to be and accept her for who she is. And that's what I've been learning. And I'm still on that journey to accept her for who she is. She's different than I am. We're actually almost the opposite of each other, you know, at times, but that's why we get along so well. Uh, she is able to humble herself and cater to all my needs, and I'm learning to do that because she's a good teacher in that. Um, she's just different. She loves animals. I hate animals. <laughs> she just loves to take care of them. She loves to feed them. She loves to spend money on them. And I don't. I think it's odd to have guinea pigs in your kitchen <laughs> that smell up things. And if it was me in the old days, I would have said, what are these things to get? They're not, uh, get them out of here before I cook them. You know, I'm like, I don't want them around. 
You know, and now it's like, that's what she wants. That's fine. And I just go in there and, okay, and walk around, you know. Not that it's always like that, you know. They're just having babies right now, so hopefully she's going to get rid of those. Because otherwise we're going to have like a bunch of them soon. So, but we're totally different in accepting her for who she is. Um, our relationship started kind of interestingly uh, according to the scriptures. And I thought this was interesting when I first read Deuteronomy 22, 28 through 29, and it talks about a man and a woman lying together. What happens in those incidences when you let your flesh go and you're young, and usually this happens at a young age, not an older age, because they're flesh and they end up sleeping with one another and then one of them gets pregnant. The Bible actually has provisions for that. And I thought it was interesting. I've used this scripture myself because usually the man wants to run away and leave the responsibility to the woman to raise those those kids. And the Bible's very clear that if you were to do that, then you are to marry the woman and you are to live with her with never getting divorce at all. That's one place in the scriptures that it says you do not get divorced for any reason at all because you laid with her when she was a virgin at a young age. And it's interesting because I actually fulfilled that scripture not even knowing the scripture uh, that God had given to us. And so it, it's neat to see the spirit working. And that truth still holds today. I really believe that. That if you're silly enough, I'm going to use another word, to lay with a woman and she gets pregnant, then you need to be responsible enough to take care of that family for the rest of your life. <clears throat> Divorce is also used as a metaphor. And just really quickly, in the Old Testament, we talked about idols. Uh, idols can take place of anything that will stop our relationship with Christ and it can divorce us from God and so a lot of times the prophets would use divorce as an analogy or a metaphor of their relationship with God where God is is basically saying I've divorced you because of your lifestyle because of your sin there's there's one prophet that that was actually asked to marry a prostitute right because God viewed Israel as a prostitute they were prostituting themselves with the cultures instead of being married to God. They had a lot of idols. And so he was making a point with them. So it's used as a metaphor also. Let's go ahead and read the, read the text to get into it. So Jesus uses the same beginning as he did in, with murder and with adultery about have you uh, heard that it was said? He says, furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. We'll deal with those two at the end there. Now, this is not exhaustive. Otherwise, we'd be here for several weeks talking about divorce because you can go to Corinthians chapter 7. You can go in, in Matthew chapter 19 or 18 when, when Jesus deals with the religious leaders concerning marriage and divorce. You can go to the Ephesians. There's a lot of areas that talk about uh, our relationships with one another. So I'm not going to exhaust this. I'm just going to deal with what Jesus is saying here. That will be for another day. Or, or if you really need uh, studies on those scriptures, let me know and we can get you a CD because I've taught on, on all of those other scriptures here. So we're going to deal with what Jesus is dealing here. And of course, he starts off as before. This is what they said. Understand this. The, the divorce was never in the Bible. It was never a commandment. It was done because of the hardness of their heart, and so God gave in to them. But he set up a system, a certificate, as Jesus mentioned here, a certificate that was supposed to be given to uh, them, a, a cooling down period in, in, a, in a sense, so that they could hopefully work it out. We still have the same system today. You know, you can't just go to a court office and get a divorce. You have to fill out all the paperwork. And then time has to go by. You have to give your reasons. And usually it takes about six months to a year before you are officially divorced today. Uh, I don't know how many times people have come up to me and said, that's it, I'm done, I'm divorced. You know, next week we're, we're out of this situation. I have even heard them say, we've worked it out. We're just kind of splitting everything right up front because we know sometimes these things can drag out. So we split up everything right up front. We're not going to argue. We're not going to fight over things, 403, 401s, and all this other stuff. We're just going to really work it out. And I'm looking at them, yeah, right. It's going to take you a year. Oh, no, no, it's not. It's going to take you a year. And sure enough, it takes about a year before you can get divorced. It's a cooling off period. So, so they took that biblical principle and we still apply it today. They want you to cool down, think about what, what you're doing. You know, I know people who have gotten divorced 
then remarried and then divorced, and then they're thinking of remarried again uh, in the past. I know people who have gotten divorced, and they're great friends now, and they both have gotten remarried, but they get along just fine as long as they're separate from one another. So God has a cooling off period, and he wants you to think about it. It's also a protection for the woman. That's why dowry, they had to pay a dowry, and usually the dowry went to uh, the father of the bride. So he kept that dowry in his bank so that if there was a divorce then he would receive his daughter back and they had provisions to take care of her because of the divorce so it was all provided for the woman here to take care of her under under the regulations of the messianic uh, law and they were given that certificate that Moses would write out to them as evidence of their divorce and that it was legal it was there's a prescription and they followed it and it was legal. Now there's a connection here. If, if you'd like, turn to Matthew chapter 19. Probably the only place that I'll, I'll go to, but just to make a point. Matthew chapter 19. And let's look at uh, a connection here with um, about divorce. And we'll start with verse 3. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? for just any reason. <clears throat> so they were dealing with some of the issues that we're dealing with today. What's the reason in re- reconcile the differences? You know, that could be anything. And they were dealing with them for any reason. And there were two thoughts back then on what the word uncleanliness meant for the reason for divorce. And so Jesus uh, is going to answer them and says, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female. Ah, oh, let me back up just for one second. He made them what? Male and female, not male and male. Not female and female, right? Very clear. Taken from the Old Testament. Um, if it was male and male, guess what? We wouldn't be here. Because there's no life that way. Or female and female. So, so that's truth. That's absolute truth. And so if you are of that persuasion, how do you get rid of that? You have to discredit the Bible. That's the only way to get rid of it is discredit the Bible because the Bible does not accept it at all. I don't care what minister stands behind the pulpit and says it's acceptable in this church. It is not acceptable to God. They're misinterpreting the scriptures. And Jesus makes it very clear. Have you not heard in the beginning This is the way that it was. This is the way that it should be. And it hasn't changed at all. He made them man and woman, male and female, and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Right? One flesh. Not separate entities. Not two different bank accounts. Not two different 403. One flesh. That's God's intention here. And yet we want to separate from one another. And that's where the problems come in because we allow seeds like that that the culture brings into our relationships and then it ends up dividing us down the road. And then we end up fighting for it in, in the court of laws because, no, this is mine. It was mine before I met you and so it's mine now. And, and you get into all of that legalities. So you become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. And so again, it refers back to chapter five. Uh, Let nothing separate that. That's really God's intention for marriage, that nothing ever separated. And I really believe, and this is me saying this, not the scriptures. I believe that it is God's heart that we not get divorced, that we somehow work through it if we can and greater glory goes to God when a couple who are struggling to become one get through that break down all the walls all the idols and are able to reflect Christ in the church then they have fulfilled that I think to its max in a sense because they have not let anyone come in and destroy that relationship a lot of things can destroy our relationships with one another. Not just adultery and fornication, but it, it can be a, a lot of different issues in our lives. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So, let no one come in and separate that. And then they said to him, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and put her away? And that is the question here. And then he goes on and he talks about the sexual immorality, which I don't want to get into. 
but you can read that later on. Let's go back to chapter 5. <clears throat> there were two, two schools of thought. One was very liberal, and one was kind of moral and conservative. The liberal aspect said that you could get a divorce pretty much for any reason. And, and so you came home one day, and you were expecting a nice meal, and when you got the meal, your meal was burnt. And you said, that's it, I'm fed up, I'm tired of having a burnt meal, that's it, I want a certificate of divorce. Go see the priest and let's get a divorce for that reason. Or if you just happen to be at the office, you know, and, and you're there at the office and there's just someone there that seems to pay attention to you, that, that just uh, thinks you're the best thing that's ever happened in the world and, and she's pretty or he's handsome and, and all of a sudden she's a little more fair than your wife and so you come home and you go, oh, and you just kind of like... I'm tired, that's it, I give up, you know, I'm, I'm tired of asking you to put makeup on, I'm tired of asking you to be pretty, I'm tired of you just always wearing your pajamas all day long, you know, whatever the case is, I want a certificate of divorce. So that was a liberal, and you can just imagine all the other things, you know, that, that could happen there, and it's just amazing, I've seen it over and over again, how little things can get into relations, things that don't even matter. And we need to learn to discern those things. And we need to really learn to communicate with each other gently and lovingly and very honestly with each other. And that's something I'm still learning, to really sit down and say, look, honey, let's, let's talk about this. I want you to hear my heart, and I want to hear your heart. And I want you to understand, I'm hearing what you're saying. I, I receive that. I may not agree with it, but I receive it. And really sitting down with one another. We need to allow them to go through those type of things as people standing on the outside. One of the worst things we can do is choose sides. You, know, you choose sides and now you've picked a side and now it not only hurts their relationship because it's not about uh, restoration now, it's about dividing when you choose sides. As parents, as siblings, as cousins, as great, great, co whoever you are, you, know, you choose sides, that's it. Because now it, it, you are now on the opposite side of your parent and you become a child against them also. And I've seen it when we don't have any clue as to what is going on in those relationships. I shared this uh, years ago, and I'm talking probably 15 years ago, I was dealing with a couple, and they were very good friends of Virginia and I. And <clears throat> they were struggling, so I was counseling with them. And I found out that um, he was having her get into relationships because that's what he liked. And it forced her to regret or, or to uh, hate him. Easier word for me, hate him. And so it ended up causing that friction and they just couldn't work it out and they got divorced. People chose sides. He, he was very crafty in his wording, very intelligent person. He was able to convince everybody it was her having these affairs. I knew better. So she became the enemy of not just people around her, but her family didn't like her. He became the hero when it wasn't even the case. And I look at that and I'm like, boy, and we've chosen sides and people are divided and they don't even know the truth of what is really taking place here. And that is why we don't choose sides. What do we do? We pray for them. We encourage them to get back together. We encourage them to seek God. We encourage them to reconcile and do as best they can to get that relationship back together because that's what God intends to do but don't you size <clears throat> that will destroy you and it will destroy your children too and this garbage of well it's not about you honey you know honey it's not about you you didn't do anything wrong it's me and daddy we just can't get along right now so you're okay it's not your fault come on give me a break you know it's going to affect them I don't care what you say to them they're children and they take it personally whether you think so or not and it will affect them. And you have to weigh these things out and what you're getting into in a relationship. Because down the road, you're like, I just don't want to live here anymore. I don't love them anymore. That's the big one. I don't love them anymore. Yeah, so what? You can live with them. And God will turn that around to where you love them. For the longest time, I didn't even know what love was. I grew up in a home that was just divided. My dad was always at work. My mom was always at home taking care of us. He was out having a party, drinking and laying with women all over the place. And my mom stayed at home and just catered to us, took care of us. And so for me to, to understand what love is, I don't know what love is. I became very selfish because I wanted to be loved. And I believe that's why I sought Virginia out because she loved me. She accepted me for who I was. 
And I love that. I love that feeling. And I still love that feeling today. <laughs> I think we all do. <clears throat> it affects us completely. I lost my train of thought there. There was a good point too. I knew it. <clears throat> okay, let's go on. So the two, if it comes back, I'll let you know. The two schools of thought, and one was very liberal. The other, the other was not as liberal. They, they would define uncleanliness as more of a moral issue. And so if you realize that the person you married actually had, uh, had sexual relationships before you were married, and you found out, then you could say, you know what? She was dishonest with me. She had relationships before, or he did. And, and so we want to get a certificate of divorce here. And so at, those were grounds enough to get that certificate of divorce. <clears throat> so furthermore, Jesus said in verse 31, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality. Okay, now, yes, that word means having intercourse with the opposite sex, but in the context, he's speaking about adultery here because he's talking about married couples. And so he's talking about having adultery with someone outside of your relationship. By the way, protect that because it's easy for you to find someone on the outside that entices you. And you can be drawn to that. That was my point, is that love. I don't love her anymore or him anymore. And so you're looking for love somewhere else. And what you're saying is, I have to have that feeling of love. See, I didn't know what love was. And when the Lord came into my life, he had to show me what love was. Because I thought it was a feeling and an emotion. And that's what we all think. Well, unless I feel it, I don't think I'm in love. When love really is an action. And I look to the cross and I say, that's love. Because Jesus died on the cross for me. He showed me. He didn't just tell me. He showed me that he loved me. And when he showed me that, that he loved me that much, then I had to learn how to die to myself for my wife. I had to see how she loved me unconditionally. There were times when I would go out and party, you know, smoke a little crack, hang out with the guys, go to nightclubs and things like that. And I'd come home and I... This is bad of me. I, I would actually tell my wife, this is what I did. And she'd look at me. It's like, oh, okay. And she would still love me. She didn't ask for a divorce. She put up with me. And I just couldn't believe that. It just, it just tripped me out. I'm like, what's wrong with this woman? You know, I can't do anything wrong to get her upset. She just loved me that much. And so God showed that to me. And I realized that my love was superficial. That true love is sacrificial. And I began to love her back. And now it's like, man, I just love this woman to death. I would die for her. You know, we're all worried about what's going on with the government. I told her, don't worry, I'll take care of you. I will cover you in front of you. I will do whatever it takes to take care of you. But that takes God to change your heart to fall in love. So don't tell me that you're not in love because God can make you in love again if you're willing to change. <clears throat> When you find that little person out there, you know, and you think she's all it or he's all it, don't believe that lie because that's the enemy and he's going to come in and he's going to destroy your relationship. It doesn't just start with adultery. It leads up to it. And that's what Jesus is trying to get to, the heart. Where's the heart there? Because you can go meet around the corner and how exciting that is to meet around the corner, both your cars parked together and you're sitting there on the hood or you're at the gym or you're at in and out or you're someplace and it's all exciting because your wife's at home or your husband's at home in their pajamas and that's not exciting anymore. That's garbage. That is garbage. And it's only going to destroy you. God's dealing with the heart here. This, this whole chapter is about the heart and how it starts here in the heart and how we need to murder, crucify that heart and sacrifice it to God and to our spouses. So if there's a relationship out there, get rid of it. That's why I said last week, you know, 
don't make friends with the opposite sex. Uh, you shouldn't have friends with the opposite sex. That only bring division in your relationship. Yeah, you have acquaintances. Yeah, you work with them. Yeah, you meet them in church and you have ministries uh, with them. But to have relationships with them in the sense that they're your best friend, you're calling them up all the time on the phone, you're meeting together for lunch and dinner. and th- No, I don't think that's biblical. I think that's harmful than it, more than anything else. Be very careful because it will lead to something else. And then he said, and whoever marries a woman, okay, now you, whoever marries a woman, that is a woman who got divorced, commits adultery with her. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, we read it earlier, right? When two individuals get married, they become what? One. They become one. Father, Son, Holy Spirit are one. We should let nothing separate that. If we allow something to separate that, that is not adultery, then we commit adultery with that person so you get divorced no grounds they burnt my food you know whatever it is and then you get divorced and then you go into another relationship you cause them to commit divorce it's not that you're causing them to continually commit divorce they've just committed divorce uh, <clears throat> or adultery with you and so it just it just deepens the the pain and the suffering in in the whole situation because you just added that to the whole mix you know, they say that um, when you get married and you become one, you are one with that person. You're mixing everything up together. And when you go with someone else, now you take everything there and you mix it up with that and then to that. And how many times has it been mixed up? That's not what God intended it to be. Marriage is more than that. We see that in Ephesians chapter 5, that marriage is a reflection of Christ and the church. And that's our responsibility is to reflect Christ and the church and that relationship that God has with the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let me close. As I said, it, it's not exhaustive, but I think you're getting the point here that we should really defend our marriages and fight for them, whatever it takes because it's the right thing to do. And if you're a born-again believer in Christ Jesus, you want to do the right thing. Uh, You want to reflect Christ in the right way. Uh, Last thing is that marriage is not a contract. Yeah, we go to the county, and we have to sign a piece of paper, pay for it, and it's a legal binding contract. And and we have 90 days, you know, before it expires. And if it expires, you've got to do the whole thing over again. So you have 90 days to go and sit down with a minister or whoever, and and then, you know, um, fulfill that contract and and be legally um, married to one another. No, it's more than that. It, it, It is a covenant relationship that you are creating. You are literally becoming one with that individual. And why would you divide yourself? And it was like you cutting an arm or a leg off when you're now one with that that person it's more than that and we know god hates it malachi chapter 2 he hates divorce doesn't like divorce because he sees what divorce causes so jesus lays down the highest standard for both sexes and and divorce should not happen in fact I, i would suggest take it out of your vocabulary don't even mention it mention more let's work through this Let's get through it. If it means separation, uh, let's separate. Let's focus on the Lord. Let's get that relationship right. Let's find out what our idols are. What is your idol? What is your idol of your husband? What do you want to see? Don Juan? You know, you want to see him looking like that? He's never going to throw that out. You know, you want him to be rich? You know, rich? He's not going to be. You know, unless he wins a lottery. But he's a Christian. He doesn't play the lottery. So forget it. Throw it out. You know, I tell my wife all the time, I said, man, I would buy you everything you wanted if I had the money. But I don't have the money. But my heart would buy you everything. I tell you, I would give you everything you wanted, but I don't have the money. I I can't pull it out anywhere. I don't have a tree in the back. (laughs) But I would buy you everything. I I guarantee you, if someone gave me $3 million right now, you'd have everything you wanted. I really would. But I can't. I can't. Throw that out. He's not going to be rich, you know? Whatever is he compassionate? Throw it out. He might not be compassionate. I'm not a very compassionate person at times. I'm a very logical. I think very clearly, and I make decisions. That's how I am. It's hard to change a person with that type of personality. You need to accept them. Accept them, but throw that out if you think he's going to one day be very, very compassionate. It's not going to happen, especially in the spur of the moment. What's going to come out is what he is. You know, he, he may try as hard as he can, but it's not going to happen. If you think she's going to be gorgeously blonde, you know, unless you can afford 
plastic surgery, forget it. <laughs> you know, this is not going to happen. You know, accept her for who she is. God has made her that way. One of the things that I always like to tell those in counseling, marriage counseling is, okay, understand this. The person you're marrying right now will not be the person that will be in 25 years. Are you willing to be married to her mother or her father? Because that's who she's going to look like. I'm like, oh, ooh, uh. you know, you have to make that decision. You have to look ahead because they're not going to stay the same. Not going to stay the same. Of course, Virginia seems to stay the same. I, I'm really blessed. She, she's beautiful. She's blonde. She's skinny. You know, she doesn't gain any weight. I mean, she's just, she's just perfect in every which way, and I should not complain at all. So throw those idols out and accept who they are. <clears throat> I have convictions. Oftentimes, it's misunderstood as control. At least, that's what my wife says. I am, uh, in a certain degree, controlling, but it's because of my convictions. And so my wife always defends me. She says, he's not controlling. He has convictions, and he stands by them. And nothing's going to sway me. I'm in a hard place, and my sons know this more than anyone else, especially with my family. I'm a pastor, and they happen to come here. So I am their pastor. And Virginia oftentimes tells me, you're my pastor. I know. I know. No, greater responsibility. But I'm also your husband, and I'm also your father. That's a hard road to switch into all the time. So at church, I could be speaking to them as a father, or I could be speaking to them as a pastor. And it's hard for us to determine which role am I at that moment. Because as a pastor, you're not going to change me. I know what I believe. I know my convictions, and I am responsible to God alone. I will stand before him, not you. And so I'm going to do what he's telling me to do. As a father, then I'm going to love you. No matter what you do, I'm going to love you. I'm going to be there for you because you're my son. Because you're my baby. And so I don't care what you've done. I'm going to be there. And you have to determine those things. <clears throat> it's a hard place to be for any of us. For any of us. Our relationships are difficult. <clears throat> and so we have to work through them. We have to fight for them because it's the right thing to do. And it reflects Christ in the church. And he wants to do a great work in you. And what's nice to know <clears throat> is that he gives you the resources. And he gives you the strength to do those things.